I am particularly happy to be introducing um, Oren Katz. He's really somebody who will make your mind spin by the time you leave this place tonight. So I think that you'll really appreciate how complexly he looks at issues around life and art. Welcome, Aaron Katz. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Kathy. It's really great fun to be here. And uh, you know, you, there's some, some amazing stuff coming out of this place. So it's always good to come back and, and see what's going on. Uh, Neolifeism is a term that uh, United and myself started to use about two or, th or about three or four years ago uh, with this idea that uh, what's going on with life at the moment is increasingly incompatible with how we as a culture see life. So what we choose to do to life to our understanding of uh, the life sciences, how we employ understanding of uh, the life sciences is increasingly becoming very different than how we were brought up to think about life. Um, and the neolifeism is a way of uh, trying to formulate this notion of the fact that what we see now is also some form of uh, fetishization of new technological approaches to life. And hopefully as uh, the talk would progress, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. But it's really about the fact that what we see now are lab-grown life forms that seem to be falling out off the charts. That there's no way we can actually culturally engage with them. And there's a need for artists to do something about it. So the idea of uh, life becoming a raw material to be engineered is not very new. As early as the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, people like uh, Jacques Laub over here was already talking about this notion of uh, engineering biology. He wanted to see biology moving away from being only a descriptive discipline to a prescriptive discipline. And he wanted to see life becoming a raw material, uh, starting to look at uh, a new palette of possibilities. He was also very much an anti-vitalist, so he was trying to uh, promote the notion that we can start to think about making life from scratch as a way of debunking this whole notion that life is special in any way or form. And, and yesterday I talked a bit about that as well. Interesting enough also, the term artificial life was actually coined to describe the type of work that uh, Jacques Laub was doing uh, back in the early 20th century. And that was forgotten and reinvented in the 1980s to talk about something very different, but uh, there's some strange convergence uh, between those notions of artificial life uh, that were developed in the early 20th century and what we see now. Um, here's one person, and here you can see this point of convergence. So you see uh, Craig Venter, and I talked about him yesterday as well, that he was, um, back in 2010, claimed that he created a new life form, uh, the first life form ever to have one of its parents as a computer. Um, and what was interesting with uh, uh, Craig Venter, that in a sense he is trying to promote and continue what uh, um, Jacques Laub was trying to, to do, and that's kind of debunked the notion of vitalism. And for Craig Venter, actually, any type of understanding life beyond the code embedded in DNA, he sees it as a form of uh, neo-vitalism. So he's really trying to be as materialistic as possible uh, with the DNA in the center of his attention in regard to what life is. Uh, anyway, we can drop those lights a bit, because it's really hard to see those images up there. Um, so what I find really interesting is that when he came out with this story, there was a big uh, media uh, celebration around it, if you like. Uh, the PR machine was working overtime to try and promote it. And Craig Venter decided to use a series of images, or his marketing people decided to use a series of images in order to try to promote this new notion of creating synthetic life, this type of life that would actually debunk the whole notion of vitalism. Uh, what I find really interesting as an artist is the fact that Craig Venter one of the main images that was used to promote this uh, microplasm laboratorium, in my perspective, was extremely metaphysical. So you can see those are the cultures of, those, of this bacteria, but the way it was presented to the, to the public, and again, is there any way we can drop the lights, please? I am working on it. All right, thanks. So hopefully you can see, but you basically see those two blue eyes gazing back at us. It's an extremely metaphysical image, image that was I would argue, designed specifically to try and capture our imagination. Uh, I have another theory that Craig Venter actually really heavily influenced by Blade Runner and wants to be Tyrell. And you can see how, and again, if the light wasn't so bright here, uh, you could actually see uh, the very strong connection between the imagery of uh, Blade Runner. Oh, thank you. And, uh, and the imagery that was chosen by Craig Venter to promote what he was supposed to be 
the debunking of the vitalist dream. Now, what's also quite interesting in this context, obviously, when you think about the creation of life by humans from scratch, which is the step that uh, Craig Venter was uh, moving towards, um, there's another very important kind of uh, um, mythological story about it. And in a sense, what Craig Venter was doing with this image was to bring the eyes to the golem. The golem is always depicted as having no eyes because it has no soul, because it was a creation of humans. And what Craig Venter does is bringing the eyes back to the golem. And eyes would become part of the story in a very strange way. Uh, I never really thought that I'll concentrate on eyes, uh, but they just keep on appearing. And I suppose it's not surprising, considering myself being a visual artist, that eyes keep on popping up in my story. When United and myself started working with this idea of uh, exploring the use of uh, tissue, living tissue as a medium for artistic expression, it so happened that uh, the first lab that uh, we ended up working in uh, was an eye research institute. Uh, we worked in the Lion's Eye Institute in Perth. Uh, this is us entering the lab. And this was what we were confronted by as we entered. So you can imagine two young art students, uh, I was actually a designer at the time, uh, entering a lab and confronted by that. Uh, those rabbits, we were told, were killed for food in the morning. The heads would be sent to a brain research institute in the afternoon, or uh, around lunchtime. And then uh, we would get those half rabbit heads after they removed the brains uh, in the afternoon. And then we would take the eyes out. You see, you're not uh, doing what you're not does best. So removing the eyes of the rabbits. And then we would put them in this antibiotic solution overnight. So you can see this is visibly a piece of dead meat. The eye was just taken from that. The eyes were then left for 24 hours within this antibiotic solution. Uh, this is a scientist we worked with. And when we looked with him down the microscope, that's what we've seen. So we were realizing that what we thought about life and death was obviously incompatible within the context of the laboratory what we worked in. Uh, those cells were alive in any way and form of what liveness is, uh, but uh, that was a piece of dead meat. So we started to think about the fact that our language, even describing what we were confronting, is not enough to, to try and deal with it. And we started to talk about those things in terms of the semi-living. So those things are alive, but not in the same way that the rabbit was alive. So we start to think about different types of gradients of life that we need to start to engage with if we are moving into this realm. Now, the idea of maintaining parts of complex organisms outside of the uh, original animal from which they were taken uh, was, again, not very new. As early as the late 19th century, scientists were already starting to work with uh, the idea of maintaining cells alive outside of the original body, uh, and mainly through the work of this guy over here, Alexis Carrel, who's considered to be the pioneer in this field of tissue culture. He was a, a scientist, a French scientist that moved to the States at the early 20th century. He had uh, given a lab in the, on the roof of the Rockefeller Institute called the Lab for Experimental Surgery, where he started to develop uh, protocols for tissue culture and other work. And in order to maintain those cells and culture, they needed, and that's something they realized very early in the stage, that they needed to create a new kind of body. So you start to see how this notion of the fact of the technologically induced life needs also to be referred to in different ways. And here you start to th think about the notion of the fact that you see bodies and technologies uh, mixing together where the body can be the technology itself. And um, I'll, I'll just use a couple of slides that I used yesterday because I think it's an extremely important point because if you, know, you don't have a way to culturally articulate what's going on, those weird beings had no place within kind of our cultural understanding of life uh, you start to see some really interesting things. So this is uh, one of the very first premature baby wards in the United States. This is in Buffalo, not so far from here. This is another one. And the reason for those crowd control rails in that, those premature baby wards was that they were in the freak show. Actually, one of the very first uh, places in Coney Island was this living infants, it's, I don't know if you can read it there, but it says uh, baby incubators with living infants. And those, this place lasted for more than 30 years in Coney Island, maintaining premature babies, having more than 80% success rate. 
And the reason for that, I would argue, is that it was so strange to see those babies in technology, those technological bodies maintaining those babies alive, that the only place they could be relegated to was the freak show. And even when hospitals started to understand how important it is and actually started to use them, it was still being distributed from Coney Island to hospitals and amusement parks. So this idea of the freak, this idea of places that are falling outside of our cultural understanding is something that uh, we started to look at uh, quite closely. A another interesting thing is that quite a lot of contemporary science or, and also science in the early 20th century was very much designed for display purposes. So this is a, a very important development in the mid-30s. Uh, this is a, what they refer to as artificial heart, uh, but it was basically a work which is a collaborative work between Charles Lindbergh, the great American aviator, and Alexis Carell uh, to develop those organ perfusion pumps. It's actually interesting that the popular media at the time was talking about the fact that they were trying to work also on developing some kind of a mechanical body, mechanical heart for Lindbergh, so for him to become some kind of a superhero. And uh, you can imagine Lindbergh was one of the first real celebrities uh, so there was lots of uh, media attention given to that and they were acutely aware of it and the way they designed the pump, the way they were presenting the pump in different fairs around the world uh, was very much uh, testimonial to their awareness of the need to create those uh, opportunities for capturing the public imagination in regard to um, the type of developments they were doing. So here are some more images of the pump just for you to understand. It was a very complex uh, system that, was a, that allowed uh, the scientists to maintain organs outside of the body for long durations of time. And here you can see this is a piece of a, a cat, um, I think it was a thyroid gland, uh, maintained alive uh, within the system. What's interesting from our perspective also that Ka when Carell started to realize where he's going with it, he actually went to a lawyer and was already starting to inquire what would be his responsibility and the liability uh, towards people that he was going to resurrect. So he started to even move towards this notion he believed his own hype, he, he believed that he'll be able to one day bring about uh, the, the notion of actually resurrecting people and he was concerned about the commercial and the financial implications of something like that. Interesting enough also when Carell and Lindbergh worked together back in the mid 30s, uh, Carell also took the time to write a pseudo philosophical book called Men the Unknown uh, and in this book he also recommends the use of gas chambers to eliminate undesirable elements in human society. And I will leave this question open if he, the realization that he had that he can break the body apart and maintain parts of bodies alive made him think about human society in a similar way, that actually you can eliminate things which are a part of, a, that are undesirable parts of human society within the context of a, economically, so disposed of in small, euthanasic institute supplied with the proper gases. So you, 1938, this is just before the Germans actually took over uh, um, his, uh, or basically accepted his recommendation to some extent and done it on an industrial scale. Uh, what's interesting as well is that when the F Nazis invaded France and the Vichy government was installed, he left the United States and moved to France to set up his Institute of Men where he was trying to employ uh, the type of philosophy that he was developing uh, in this book, in Men They Are Known. And, and it's, it's an amazing document, actually, to read, so I would recommend you to all read it and be horrified. Uh, now we're jumping quite a few years forward. 1997, Boston, Massachusetts. At first glance, it seems impossible. Yet, like something out of science fiction, this animal may actually become a trailblazing hero. American scientists have successfully grown and attached a human ear onto the back of a mouse. The ethics are controversial. Though many believe this is horrifically cruel to the animal, others see an amazing breakthrough that could save lives. How, was How many of you are remembering seeing this image 20 years ago? Almost exactly, yeah. Uh, for me, as an artist, it was one of the most important images of the late 20th century. I'm, I'm actually working now. The, one of the reasons why I'm here and uh, Katie didn't have to fly me all the way from Australia was that I got funding uh, to come to Boston to interview all of the players that were involved in the creation of the original uh, mouse with earrings back. It's still very fresh and I'm still trying to... I, I found out some amazing stories which I just want to take time to formulate. Uh, but there's some really strange things happening with that. And 
I wouldn't claim, and actually all of the scientists I, work to, uh, I talk to claim that the reason why they've done it was totally scientific. Uh, I wouldn't claim that uh, they had other agendas in mind, but uh, it's obviously they were acutely aware, at least after the image was released, at how effective it was as a way of capturing the public imagination. And how, uh, to such an extent that actually one of the main scientists around it uh, that was involved with it, uh, Charles Vacanti, copyrighted any type of depiction in any media of a mouse that has a human ear growing from its back. So if you're an artist trying to do it, he can come and sue you for depicting any, in any media, sculpture, painting, animation, or whatever, he holds the copyright for that. So obviously he was acutely aware of how important the image became. And, and for me it was an extremely important image. I think this was the thing that really drove me into the notion that now we can sculpt with living bodies to such an extent that you can create, basically resurrect or, or bring alive the surrealist dream. Yeah. And this technology that uh, the year was developed is called uh, tissue engineering. And tissue engineering in, is, in my eyes, a very important technology, not so much because what it can do, because actually what's interesting as well with this research that I was doing now, 20 years later, I went to the lab and they're still trying to grow ears. They're not even close to achieving what was claimed back then in 1995 uh, that they've done. The promise is there, and I think this is what's important. It's not so much the actualities, it's really the conceptual shift in our understanding of bodies that was manifested through the mass return spec and obviously through this whole idea of tissue engineering uh, into a field which is now being called uh, regenerative medicine or regenerative biology. And, and those images actually ended up working for a year in Harvard Medical School as a research fellow together with Janat Zur. Um, in the lab of his brother, the brother of Charles Vacanti, in the lab of Joseph Vacanti, who's considered to be the pioneer in the field of tissue uh, engineering. And those slides are actually from his presentation from the year 2000 when he presented it in a meeting of uh, the Tissue Engineering Society, I think it was the second or third meeting ever, uh, in Disney World, appropriately enough, in Orlando. And uh, what he was showing is kind of this, uh, again, he was very much aware of this conceptual shift that he brought about. So here is an image of how we thought that uh, the body would be repaired from 1989. So you can see the idea there was that every failing and missing and a ailing body part would just be replaced by some kind of a, a mechanical apparatus. So basically using a hard, dry technology to try and replace those body parts, which didn't really prove to be very successful. And this is from exactly 10 years later, 1999. The notion would be that we would somehow harvest and harness the latent regenerative powers of our bodies in order to grow again those body parts. And this is in the base of so much of what we hear about now in the media about biomedical research, stem cell research, all of those notions are coming from the realization that actually we can start to look at the body as a site of, that repairs itself and uh, basically looking at the body as the place where we can start to grow our own body spare parts. Uh, the idea of the time, again, this is a slide from Vacanti's presentation from 15 years ago, uh, where he, the, the no, original idea of tissue engineering, and this is how the mouse on the back of the ear was created, you start with a degradable poly polymer scaffold, and you then seed it with the appropriate cells, and that was before stem cells became so popular, and you culture the cells on this construct, on this three-dimensional scaffold for a while outside of the body, meaning in vitro, and then you implant it into the body and you're supposed to have a body spare part. And again, it's like more than 20 years of research. There's only two products that came out of it that were FDA approved. One is skin and the other one is bladder. Very, very simple organs with very thin uh, organs. This doesn't really go anywhere in the context of what was the original idea. Uh, from my perspective though, I was kind of looking at reversing the logic. So if in 1880, if 1989 we were told we can replace the heart with a pump, come mid-90s we were starting to talk about the idea of actually growing hearts, my question was why not grow pumps? Yeah, so why not use this technology without ever reintroducing it into a body uh, in order to grow products? So I came from a very naive and uh, uh, idealistic uh, ecological design perspective looking at changing the culture of manufacturing to a culture of growing. And we thought, I thought that that might be a great solution. Uh, but as I started to look closer at that, and that was kind of my, was my first proposal actually to try and grow uh, living surfaces over uh, domestic products. 
Uh, but as I was starting to think about it more, I realized that there's so many, un so many questions that still have to be addressed before we can start to think about those in terms of creating products that I decided to continue the project um, as an artistic research project. So I came and as I said, I knocked on the door of the scientists. I got access to the, this uh, eye research institute, started to culture uh, the skin from the eyes of rabbits, and we started to grow them over those types of glass figurines. We never imagined that we would actually be able to uh, exhibit our live tissue engineered sculptures outside of the lab. So we were trying to look at different types of uh, representational techniques. So we started by growing the skin cells over glass. We then moved to other cell types and other types of uh, materials and substrates. Uh, this is a piece from 2000 called the Stone Age of Biology. And the idea there was to miniaturize prehistoric stone tools and made them, make them out of this uh, special uh, hydrogel, the special material that the cells can grow over it. In this case, we used muscle and nerve cells, and we ground them onto those miniaturized version of those uh, prehistoric stone tools. And the idea there was that we are now in a very similar way to the way our ancestors started to chip away stones and actually transformed us into what we are now, which is a technology-based organism, we are now starting to chip away life. And it's going to take us to places that we can't even imagine. Uh, then, in the year 2000, as I said, Jonathan and myself got invited to Harvard Medical School, and we started to work with much more sophisticated materials, and we were also invited to show our work in Ars Electronica, where we tried for the first time to show our live tissue-engineered sculptures within a cultural context. And in order to do so, we transplanted a fully functioning tissue culture lab into, that was the foyer of the Bruckner House, of the foyer of the local opera house, and we grown what uh, we thought would be very appropriate for the first tissue engineered sculptures. We grown our own version of the Guatemalan worry dolls. And the Guatemalan worry dolls are small dolls you give to kids before they go to sleep. Uh, the kids tell the worries to the dolls, put the dolls under the pillow, and the dolls are supposed to take the worries away. Uh, so we've done our own version of the Guatemalan worry dolls by handcrafting those dolls out of this special polymer, which is like felt and surgical sutures, and we then seed them with cells. Uh, we also were trying to show the liveness of those uh, sculptures by having daily feeding times, like in the zoo. So people would come and see us doing the very mundane and boring work of actually taking the nutrient solution, the old nutrient solution out, and replacing it with fresh nutrient solution. Uh, the, the worried dolls didn't perform any tricks as part of that. They were just lying there, growing slowly. Uh, but we also had this thing which we call the worry machine, <coughs> Sorry. where we were trying to induce people to express their anxieties and worries, in particular in the areas that we were interested in, this idea of what's going on with life. Uh, not realizing that actually many people projected some magical powers to those worry dolls and basically expressing some of the most intimate worries, uh, which had nothing to do with biotechnology or the worry dolls that we were growing, but really to do with their own personal life. And we ended up with this huge database, because we show this piece quite a lot still. Uh, so we ended up with a huge database, it's kind of uh, looks at anxieties of people since the year 2000 until now, um, which is on our website. Recently, we also changed the, the format so people actually whisper the worries to the dolls, and actually the whispers, and that's, I'll speak about Adam and his contribution to something like that shortly, uh, the whispers are kind of vibrating the cells as they grow and change their growth pattern in some very symbolic way. Uh, but another thing which is quite interesting from our perspective is that uh, what we started to do then, and we're still doing now, so whenever we show our work internationally, rather than to try to travel with living biological material, uh, we approach a local lab, and we try to, s to work with them and try to work with uh, the type of uh, cells that they have in the lab. Uh, so at the time, we were able to make contact with uh, the local virology department in the hospital, and we asked them to send us a list of the cells that they were working with, and one cell in particular caught my eye, uh, that was a cell line called the McCoy cell. So, just to, to put in context, when you have cells, you can either take them directly from the organism, which is called primary tissue, and those cells would grow, but they would, most of them would have a finite amount of divisions uh, they would go through before they'll stop dividing. And then you have what's called immortalized cells, and those cells that originally uh, or originated from cancer cells, now there's other ways to induce uh, this immortality of cells, and they can divide forever. I'm sure you all heard about the HeLa cells, for example. Um, so when we looked at the cell lines that uh, the, this virology lab had, we basically um, <coughs> had a list of about 10 different cells, and one of them, the McCoy cell line, was caught my eye, initially because I thought it would be really nice that the first tissue engineered sculptures to be presented uh, in a cultural context would be named after the first doctor from Star Trek. 
Uh, but really what was more interesting is the fact, and this is kind of part of the, the really amazing world of tissue culture and cell lines, is that although those cells originated from the knee joint fluid of a patient suffering from arthritis, from a human, in a cell line that was, I suppose, contaminated by another type of cell, the strain L mouse fibroblast, which was actually the very first cell line to be developed in uh, the late 1940s, um, took over, but those cells have been distributed from laboratory fr to laboratory when they still thought that they're human. So there's no way to distinguish between human and animal cells in this context unless you do a very specific test to do it. So, and there's so many of those stories where there's no, designa the designation of the cells has nothing to do with what they actually are. And, and so many false uh, research projects are based on uh, contaminated cells. So we thought that this is very appropriate. Uh, this, and we, as I said, we were showing this work in different contexts. Uh, we, with the worry dolls, we always need to set up a fully functioning lab in the gallery. And in many cases, and we found out that this technological uh, framing takes over the actual story of the worry dolls. Uh, but that was kind of our uh, experiment and, and our attempt to find ways in which we can show our live tissue engineered sculptures within a gallery situation. So different designs, this lab was hidden almost completely with the worry dolls over there. So uh, we can then start to focus the attention on the actual interesting objects that we were trying to uh, get the audience to engage with. Uh, after the worry dolls, we moved to another project which was called the Pig Wings Project. This project was dealing with the hype and promises of uh, uh, the biotech industry. It was originally commissioned for a show to celebrate the so-called first draft of the completion of the first draft of the Human Genome Project. And uh, what we were doing there, we were looking at the ways in which um, winged entities are being displayed in, in Western mythology when you think about the fact that the uh, things which are attached to bat wings are usually the devils and demons, uh, things which are attached to bird wings are usually angels, and then when you think about the three evolutionary solution of flight in vertebrates, the pterodoxals, the flying dinosaurs, we don't really have much cultural attachment to them, so they're kind of fairly neutral. Uh, so we were kind of playing on this idea, obviously, if pigs could fly, everything is possible, which was to do with the rhetoric and the hype around the Human Genome Project at the time. But then we said, like, there's two, three different ways in which we can engage with it. We can either be afraid it's going to destroy us, we can hope that it's going to save us, or we can say, just give us some more time to figure out what's going on there. And the way we've done it was uh, we harvested uh, bone marrow stem cells from a knee of a pig. The pig was already killed for another research project, so the, key, the pig didn't suffer directly to do with our work. Uh, we then uh, we designed those three sets of wings. We actually used three-dimensional printing, 3D printing, to print out uh, those wing structures. We made them out of this very special polymer, and we ground them in different ways uh, within this microgravity bioreactor uh, that we also used to grow the worry dolls. Uh, but we've done something else there, and that was in collaboration with Adam, Adam Zoretsky, where we also developed what we refer to as the dynamic seeding musical bioreactor. So in order to be able to actually distribute the cells throughout the, this three-dimensional construct, and also we knew we were trying to make them into bony structures, we knew that lots of research was done into the vibration, the effect of vibration on bone healing, so we were trying to experiment with that. Uh, and also at the time, Napster was just about to shut down, so we put keywords, pig, and we played pig music to uh, the wings. See them dancing over there. And that was a lot to do with uh, the research that uh, Adam was doing at the time in MIT, uh, to looking at the effect of vibration on uh, bacteria, and we translated it to the tissue culture. And what was interesting, and this is kind of, uh, actually I just presented it to the lab in Boston again, and they were, oh wow, yeah, it actually makes sense. Um, those that we played, those wings that we played music to, uh, had a really nice distribution of the cells throughout the, the actual object, as opposed to those we didn't. And the morphology, we were told, is very much more bone-like than those that uh, were not uh, played music to. The interesting story was that actually when we presented that project to the commissioning body uh, that for the show that was supposed to celebrate the, this, uh, co this first draft of the Human Genome Project, they rejected it. And we were able to annoy them so much that it was one of the most honest and brutal rejection letters we ever got, uh, where they were basically questioning 
the artistic and scientific merits of our work and you know, really calling us names and being extremely offended by that, um, which was great because it kind of, that letter became part of the piece itself. Um, what's interesting enough that now those big wings are on the walls of the Museum of Modern Art in New York on a permanent display and the very same commissioning organization is now interested in buying those tiny objects that the wings were. And this was also quite interesting from our perspective. This is when we started to talk about our work in terms of the aesthetics of disappointment. Uh, people would come to the gallery uh, hoping and believing that technology is so advanced that uh, we can grow, if not flying pigs, we can grow wings which are big enough for pigs to fly with. And they would come to the gallery and see those uh, tiny objects in those cheap jewelry boxes and get quite disappointed. And it became a really important part of especially this work because this whole work was about the promise and the disappointment uh, to do with the technologies of the time and especially to do with uh, this uh, first draft of uh, the Human Genome Project that wasn't really completed when the celebrations took place. Now we'll jump to another project. This is the Victimless Leather Project. So that was part of a series of works that we refer to as the technologically mediated Victimless Utopia. The In Vitro Meat Project was one of them as well. Uh, but what we've done with the Victimless Leather Project, we also started to pay more attention to this technological body uh, that uh, Karel and his colleagues were referring to, this new kind of body in which to grow the cell. So this uh, technological body is a direct reference to the original Karel Lindbergh pump. And we have a small jacket there that is grown out of uh, human and mouse cells uh, and creating something which resembles leather to some extent. Uh, what, what was interesting as well that when it was shown at um, MoMA in New York, we actually f used for the very first time mouse embryonic stem cells and they sheared off the, this three-dimensional polymer structure and started to travel throughout the system and clogged the system to such an extent that uh, it had to be turned off about five weeks into the show. And this is a quote from Paolo Antonelli, Antonelli uh, referring to kind of the, the issues surrounding what it means to turn off a piece of mouse cells grown into a shape of a jacket in MoMA. Uh, when it hit the news, it was quite interesting because this is the kind of stories that came about. I really like the MoMA Kills art, uh, which is so appropriate on so many different levels. Uh, but, but what was really good from our perspective that this perceived failure was the most successful artistic interventions that we, intervention we could have. Uh, the context of the show was a fairly optimistic show which was talking about what happens when you get artists and designers to work with scientists and how they're going to solve all of the problems of the world. While the only living thing within this whole exhibition, that had about 250 pieces, died halfway through the show and the whole discussion was then uh, converted to discussion about our responsibility towards l living things that we are somehow responsible for the growth. Uh, what I really like about the Victimless Letter as well is we show it quite a lot around the world and each time we show it something else goes wrong. Uh, so this is from Luxembourg. This is how it looked like. Suddenly I get an, uh, uh, an email with this image and like, what the hell happened here? Uh, and, and this is like a, another really beautiful thing within the context of uh, putting this type of work in a museum. Museums are designed and were set up to hold dead things and keep them dead and unchanged for as long as they can. And then we come along and those kind of things are happening. So this is from the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, the Medicine and Art Show, where we had, I get a phone call, actually I was still in Tokyo, and they say there's a small speck there, we want you to come and check it, and that was a small fungal uh, contamination. So for the first 10 days of the show, I came every day to the show and administered med medicine to my art. I put fungus on and tried to stop this contamination from taking over. Uh, but that's how it ended up. And actually, from my perspective, it's way more interesting than if we were successful in growing a leather-like material in the context of this piece. Uh, and it is, this notion of control and the loss, to, the loss of control is something which is extremely important for us. Working with living systems, you have to remember that you actually work collaboratively rather than uh, try to impose your control over them. Saying that, there's already a growing number of uh, places around the world, companies that are starting to look at using those technologies to create consumer products. So this is Modern Meadow. They got $350,000 from Peter Tile to create a 3D printed uh, leather and meat. Uh, so you can see how those stories are now starting to be used mainly to attract venture capitalists. I don't know if they will ever be able to successfully come up with a product, uh, but it's interesting to see where it's going. Um, because I promised I'll be talking about neolifism, I'll just kind of mention very briefly stuff that I was talking about yesterday. The movement between our understanding of life and how we were priv privileging form. So when you think about the Natural History Museum as a way in which we learn about life 
what we encounter are idealized forms of a kind. So all of those uh, specimens, the toxodermic specimens are actually an idealized form of the actual organism rather than the actual organism. The only thing which belongs to the original organism is the hide. Um, but now we're moving away from this type of uh, privileging form to privileging information. Yeah, so the idea now is that those, this is how the collection of the Natural History Museum in Queensland looks like, where you have DNA and tissue uh, preserved in cryogenic conditions as a way of us understanding what this, those living systems are. Obviously, it's not very attractive to the audience, but it is the way we tend to think about life within this context. We're starting to, and, and this is what we're starting to talk about as neolifism, this fetishization of those frozen bits standing for the animal. Uh, to do with new technological animals or life, uh, there's still some forms that we worship. So there's things like the new chicken or dolly, which uh, is an extremely interesting uh, fetishized uh, object. So there's so many different kind of reliquars of, of dolly in different museums around the world. And if you really want to be serious, you can go to the Welcome Collection and worship uh, dolly's droppings, uh, if you're really into it. And obviously, a good friend, the mouse with urine spec, uh, I now learned as well, I knew that uh, in the uh, Science Museum in Shanghai, a scientist over there, Yelin Chao, uh, created a mouse specifically for the museum without even an attempt to talk about it in terms of uh, science. He basically created one of those EMIs specifically for the Science Museum in Shanghai. It lived there for about two weeks before they had to kill it and preserve it. Uh, I now learned that there's at least four other mice that were created specifically for display purposes uh, around the world. Uh, interesting enough, also, kind of the artist moved into this imagining of those new life forms, the fetishization of those new um, lab grown or human modified life forms. This is the very famous GFP bunny by Eduardo Katz. Uh, interesting enough, when I went to the Natural History Museum in Vienna uh, in 2003, I think it was, when it was the celebration of the uh, 150th anniversary for the, creation, uh, for the publication of The Origin of Species by uh, Charles Darwin. In this exhibition, they also had like this projection to the future and they had a section about uh, transgenic art. And as a reference to Eduardo's bunny, they got one of the scruffiest hairs from their collection and they shined a green light on it and said, here, we've done genetic art ourselves. <laughs> and they actually had it in the catalog. It's such an amazing image. So going back to this is the Human Genome Project. Again, I think quite a lot of this fetishization of DNA as if this is the essence of who we are obviously came from the whole hype around the Human Genome Project. You can see the head of the Wellcome Trust talks about the fact that it's much more than the invention of the will. It's the essence of mankind. And as long as humanities exist, it's going to be important and will be used. Um, interesting enough, what the Human Genome Project found out is how much more complex things are and how much less genes are there within the human genome than to explain the complexity of who we are. Uh, but they developed some really good technologies like DNA sequencers that became quite important for uh, much of the research that takes place at the moment. Those are statements about the fact that uh, the Human Genome Project celebration in June 2000 was grandiose. They actually admitted that it was done for political reasons rather than scientific reasons. Uh, so you can understand where our pig wings project kind of came about. Uh, but one of the things that came out of the Human Genome Project, as I mentioned, is the development of DNA sequences that then allowed to develop a new, a totally new way of looking at the world. And that uh, is starting to be known more and more now in the terms of metagenomics where you do DNA analysis of environments rather than of individual species. So what you do, you take samples. Uh, in this case, you can take stool samples, for example, from a patient, and you find out the, the diversity and the range of life forms that exist there without understanding exactly who they are and where they are. Uh, what the, uh, those, the, the metagenomics allowed us to understand is how much more complex, for example, our uh, microbiome, the, the flora, the type of uh, uh, other organisms that share our body, uh, are and to such an extent that uh, people like Craig Venter, for example, is now realizing because one of the issues is that um, up to metagenomics, we could only work and understand bacteria that we could culture. So about 90% of the bacteria we, in certain environments you can't culture, and therefore they were rendered totally invisible to science. Uh, but through metagenomics, you understand how much more complex it is. And now Craig Venter is actually talking about somehow as a great business model, I would say. Uh, somehow engineering the microbiome, for example, uh, to be proprietary uh, for him. So it means that he would clear up your guts and you would get his bacteria. And obviously, like with uh, uh, things with Monsanto, if they do a stool sample and you have the bacteria that you didn't pay royalties for, 
you will be fined. It's a great business model, I think. But I don't know if you want to go into it. But this idea of the, the fetishization of the DNA as if that stands for the animal, even though now we understand how much more complex our relationship to our gut flora, for example, and the environment in which we operate is manifested through things like the frozen arc. So here we have the frozen arc. This is the Christmas special from a couple of years ago where they said if you pay 450 pounds, you can, have, you can sponsor a piece of frozen tissue. Um, six, another uh, contribution, you can, of 450 pounds, you can have the DNA. Uh, if you have uh, 10 million dollars, you would be able to keep the frozen arc project forever, whatever that means. Like, the idea of time is quite strange in this, within this context. But what's interesting about that is this idea that we don't really need to care anymore because what we can do now is to maintain endangered species or extinct species in the freezer as an insurance policy so we don't really need to care about the environment anymore because we've got it. We, we can revive them in some stage in the future to such an extent that uh, Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation says that the species is not completely extinct until we know there is no way to discover or deduce its full genome. So this is again what uh, Craig Venter is trying to do, this fetishization of DNA as if that stands for the organism. So forget about the environment, the cell mechanism in which this DNA needs to operate. There's actually quite a lot of stuff in the cell that DNA doesn't code for. Forget about the other companion species that share this body. Forget about the environment in which it operates. We can be okay, you know, as long as we know that we have the DNA somehow, somehow stored in the freezers, we're okay with that. And this is kind of this notion in which this fetishization of this notion of life is extremely ridiculous and it's driven by people who should know better. Those are, the frozen ark is a consortium of natural history museums and zoos around the world, but they still sell this notion that we can actually do it if we have the frozen cells or the frozen DNA. So we did a series of works that refer to it. This is on neolifism. I won't get into it because I want to jump into another area, um, which is, I think, where my story is kind of getting a bit complicated. So when you think about neolifism, when you think about DNA, you also see, and we go to the lab, and you actually see objects. You see things which are much more than that. Uh, there's actually the lab, one of the labs I visited in Boston last week, they're one of the world experts in this thing which is called ghost organs. What they do, they take organs from cadavers, humans or animals, and they decellularize it. So basically they take the cells of the dead animal and remove them using different types of detergent. Left, what they're left with is what they refer to as the ghost organ, which is basically the matrix, the collagen matrix usually, uh, that is the space between the cells. And then they seed it with stem cells, and most of the stem cells actually have an under a special understanding, and they would differentiate into this right type of tissue, depending on the environmental cues that they have just from growing within this three-dimensional architectural form, which is the original organ that was, de was decellularized. Uh, what's interesting from my perspective as well is that there's, very, there's such a huge cultural amnesia, but the way they portray it, and actually when I was there, there was a Korean TV crew uh, shooting retelling the Alexis Carell story without even knowing. So you start to see those stories coming back and forth and responding. But from our perspective, and this is something that United myself were talking a lot about, the notion that a lot of our work was dealing with the cells that we were working with, we were dealing with this technological body that we were thinking about, but we didn't really pay much attention to the substrate, this context in which cells and the tissue that we're growing operates. Uh, so then I had an opportunity to go to the very far north of Lapland, to a place called Kilbaseri, uh, where I was invited to host a group of uh, artists, and I was asked to come up with some kind of a theme, and I said, from my perspective, I've never been there before, I thought that uh, it's going to be only ice and water and rocks and nothing else. So I said, this would be the perfect place to look for what I was referring to as the proto-substrate, the, the thing that I can take to start and grow life, which is the most neutral, because life didn't really exist there and I could then grow tissue over this kind of pure proto-substrate that I would find somehow in this far north of Lapland. Um, it was amazing because as I arrived there and being from Australia and in Australia if you go out to the outback you know that after two days if you don't have the right supplies you die. In Lapland that was in September there was still very very lush there was so much life there that I was taken by that. It was like, it was so lush, and also there was so much stuff that I could maintain my own biological body. There were berries and mushrooms and reindeers, I could, and water and fresh water. I could actually survive there until the winter would come, 
uh, with no problems, and obviously have those amazing displays of uh, the Northern Lights as well. Uh, but I couldn't connect. The whole notion, the whole reason I went there was to try and find this proto-substrate in this totally arid, frozen environment, and, and I was just encountering more and more life of different forms uh, in ways that I couldn't really figure out what I can do with it. So we were trying to do desolarization, we were trying to do all of those kind of things, but nothing really felt right for me. And then as I was walking one day up on the mountain, I came across this site over here, and it looked as if there was some kind of a fire that happened there, from my perspective, not too long ago. It was, looked very fresh and looked as if it happened uh, sometime, but not too long ago. There was like those mangled pieces of metal around, uh, all of those very strange things. And then I came across a sign that was in Finnish, so I needed someone to translate. I could recognize, okay, aeroplanes, what was going on there. And actually, this is, this is a sign that came uh, three, two years later, they changed the signs so people like myself could actually understand what's going on there. And the story was that in 1942, it was actually in June 1942, a formation of nine German Junker bombers was making its way to Norway over the Lake Kilpaseri towards the Eastern Front. One of the planes began to give off smoke and lose attitude. The plane made the forced landing here, it's actually crashed, uh, where the bombs it was carrying exploded. And out of the four men crew, two died instantly, one survived, but suddenly, I realized that actually there's something there because as I was, so here is the Junker 88, those types of planes very similar to, what, to the one that crashed there. And in this crash site, once I understood what I'm dealing with, I found this small piece of perspex. And that reminded me that actually in the history of synthetic biomaterials, the way in which, okay, before I'll go there, uh, it reminded me two things. So, so it reminded me something about the history of biomaterials, which I'll tell you shortly, but also it reminded me that I knew that Charles Lindbergh, your great American hero, was an advisor to the German Luftwaffe, to the Nazi Air Force, at the very same time that he was actually working with Alexis Carell on this organ perfusion pump. And as far as I know, and the literature tells us, Lindbergh was the first American to be permitted to see this very type of aeroplane that I saw crashing at the crash site in Lapland. What's interesting as well that our good friend Lindbergh wrote an essay in uh, Ridger's Digest back in 1939 where he was trying to convince his fellow Americans not to join the war against Germany. And here's the reason. So he says, aviation seems almost a gift from heaven to those Western nations who were already the leaders of their era, strengthening their leadership, their confidence, their dominance over other people. It's a tool specifically shaped for Western hands, a scientific art. Yeah? If all of you want to do scientific art, here it is. Uh, which others only copy in mediocre fashion, another barrier between the teeming millions of Asia and the Grecian inheritance of Europe, one of those priceless possessions which permit the white race to live at all in a pressing sea of yellow, black, and brown. This is your hero, yeah? So that was one thing that stayed in the back of my mind. And obviously this type of rhetoric <laughs> is not very different from what we're experiencing now. But the other thing about this small piece of perspex was the fact that the very first realization that synthetic materials can be compatible with the body for implants came about when German and British and American planes crashed and it was the first time that they were using um, perspex for the cockpits and those shrapnels would get into the body and there would be no rejection. So I traveled all the way to the very far north of Lapland to find a piece of plastic that was the proto-substrate that I was looking for, which was striking for me. And it kind of changed quite a lot of the way I've seen the things, but obviously the whole birth of tissue culture, of regenerative medicine, the whole birth of this notion of the fact that we can have compatible materials which are synthetically made with our own body, um, came from those small pieces of plastic in First World War, and especially those that got into the eyes of the, of the pilots, which was why I started working with eyes in the very first place. So it was kind of an interesting place to find myself. And just to continue kind of what uh, Lindbergh was saying, because he was saying aviation, using it symbolically as well as in its own rights, bring two great dangers. One peculiar, peculiar to our modern civilization, the other older than history, since aviation is dependent on the intricate organization of life and industry, it carries with it the environmental danger of people too far separated from the soil and from the sea, the danger that the physical decline, which is so often goes with high intellectual development, 
of that spiritual decline which seems to inevitably uh, to accompany an industrial life of that racial, racial decline which follows the physical and spiritual mediocrity. And in a sense, being able only to connect to a piece of plastic in this amazing piece, place of nature, I kind of fulfill this prophecy in a very strange way, uh, which I find very disturbing. And I was trying to find ways around it. So then when I was invited two years later to continue this project, I decided to look at it uh, from a totally different perspective because what I felt was that I'm actually engaging in something which is very much like a puzzle, uh, very much like this whole idea of metagenomics. So the second version or the second uh, uh, chapter of this project from my perspective was to go back to those sites, to this site, and um, collect the soil to see if there's any difference between the soil that was obviously so violently uh, uh, interrupted by the crash of the plane uh, with the surrounding area. So this is taking samples and Kathy was one of the people in my group. We had an amazing group of people all coming and researching and trying to engage in what we started to talk about, uh, this notion of the unpredictability and the unintentionality of human activity. So as a way of thinking about what it means when humans are engaged in those violent actions against an environment, in this case it was an accidental small scale a violent action against the environment, how is that going to change the whole cascading events that would come through through the changes of the, the population of bacteria within this environment. Um, so we collected those samples and we actually sent them to be an analyzed and metagenomically analyzed and what we found that there's obviously, and this is just, we just got those results two weeks ago so it's still very fresh and we're still trying to make sense, but you can see that it's obvious that those uh, bacterial communities in the, in the crest site are extremely different than those just 20 meters away. How much is it? Like, I don't know how many yards or whatever. Anyway, kind of close uh, to the crest site itself. Uh, we were also kind of trying to create this whole meta-narrative around this site. So we actually worked with the uh, European Union people who were uh, doing um, drone monitoring. So we actually were trying to map that environment using drones as a way of kind of referring back to, to the Karel uh, Lindberg or to Lindberg's uh, involvement as, as well as kind of um, trying to create yet another layer of complexity uh, by mapping this whole area uh, which we were able to map one of the, the sites that we found and yeah this is just boys with toys uh, but we we're actually able to create another layer which uh, we, we're going to put on uh, Google Earth uh, but another thing which I found really interesting, and I suppose I'll finish with this little story because that's another strange addition to the story. So I came to Kilpasari to do a residency there uh, about two weeks before the group arrived and they put me in this, uh, one of the stations. Uh, it, it's all part of uh, the uh, biological research station of the University of Helsinki in the most far north part of Finland. And one of the, research, one of the arms of the research station was this house over here. Uh, where they had um, this array of uh, antennas that are to do with uh, collecting data about the Northern Lights. And, uh, you know, it's a biological research center. They've got like a, a great sauna, uh, but also kind of they, they take boats out into the lake. Uh, and in this area over here, as I was walking, and actually the day I arrived, I kind of put my bag and I decided to walk around. I started, I came across this, which was very strange. And then I came across more of it. And no one was telling me this about this place. You know, people knew about my interest in the uh, German plane crash site, but no one was telling me that this exists just under our nose in that very same research station. And as I was kind of looking around and finding all of those strange things, uh, I started to ask around and, and I found some uh, information. This was a, an explosion site of a Russian ammunition depot from 1916. And what's interesting here was that Again, it looked as if it happened yesterday. No one disturbed it. It's a 100-year-old site that changed the environment around it quite significantly, or this small environment, this micro uh, environment. The scar is just unbelievable. You could actually see it from the mountain, uh, from across the, the lake. And you could see all of the Russian script over there. There were so many different things within the site. And no one from the Biological Research Center, the station is there for more than 60 years, no one thought about analyzing this site as well. So that's the other thing we're doing. And from our perspective, it also reminded me another story about the unintentionality, 
of biotechnology because the story is quite amazing. Back in 1914, a Jewish Russian scientist in the University of Manchester was joining the war effort in trying to help the British developing, they had a bottleneck in regard to the production of acetone that was needed to be used uh, to develop or to, to make a gown powder. And the Germans somehow had a much better supply of acetone and the Brits didn't really have much. And, and so there was a bottleneck in, in the supply of uh, that for ammunition. And this Russian Jewish guy was using for the very first time what is now being known as industrial fermentation to ferment acetone. So it's the first time that actually they were using bacteria and the process of fermentation to ferment stuff which wasn't food. And he was fermenting acetone, he was fermenting also some other elements that were needed for the development of a synthetic rubber. And that is considered to be the birth of industrial biotechnology. What was interesting with that was that this guy, his name was Chaim Weizmann, he was also the president of the Zionist movement in the UK. And as a thank you for him, after the war, the then a uh, foreign minister of the British government, Lord Balfour, declared Palestine as being the home state for the Jewish people. So one can argue that quite a lot of the geopolitical issues that we are facing now in the Middle East are a result of biotechnology in a very strange way. So just when people tell us that they have control over what's going on in biotechnology, I always like to remind them that story, that some of the major issues around the world actually came from biotechnology without any intentionality. And I suppose I'll leave it here. Thank you.